Hi everybody, Trevor Busworth here from the UK Contact Centre Forum. Nice to have you join us today. Uh, today's session is something that we've been asked about quite a bit now by our members, is around contact centre security, cyber security, which seems to be growing, which is, which is not good. So I'm joined today by my fellow uh, co-host, Chris D'Souza. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Trevor. Good to be here. Thank you for joining us. And our special guest today is a gentleman called Tim Burton, who is the Chief Customer Officer of an organisation called Smart Numbers. Tim, welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Tim, I just wonder if you could give us a you know a couple of minutes around who you are, what you do, and uh, so the uh, viewers know exactly who uh, who's on today's session. Yeah, no worries. So, yeah, good to meet everyone. Uh, Tim Burton. So I, I look after our customer function at Smart Numbers, which... A lot of people ask me, what, what is a customer function? We essentially are responsible for making sure that we deliver the right level of value to our customers. Um, and that really is broken down into making sure that we have a good understanding as to what the industry threats look like, particularly in the contact center and telephony space, um, how our product uh, is, is, is designed to combat those types of problems and also where our product should go over time, and how our customers are, are, are operationalizing the capabilities that our product brings to make sure they can actually close gaps on, on those problems that they suffer from. So that puts us in a very unique position where we, we have a, a tremendous amount of information around these, uh, these security threats, um, the impact those threats have on some of the constraints that, that organizations um, need to manage and juggle, um, and also where, where the industry is going as a whole with regards to technological enhancements and also um, consumer expectations. So um, yeah, there's a, a pretty much a, a wrapped up summary of a relentless focus on value and making sure that we, we've covered that off from, from all angles. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, so I think what we'll do, let's get uh, straight into it. And our first question, and it's actually from one of our members, is uh, what are the most common types of fraud that occur these days in contact centres? And that's, that's a really, really good question. And I think it, it does vary by sector. Um, we, we have a number of sectors that, 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 that all offer services via the contact center. There are essentially there are three key stages within a fraud life cycle that we're seeing a number of problems in, in the contact center. The first is reconnaissance. And what we mean by reconnaissance is the ability to be able to take data that's compromised via an alternative means. That could, for example, be a cyber breach where data is stolen from a data center via a digital channel. Um, and the reconnaissance is really doing two things. One is validating that the data that's being stolen is in fact um, accurate. Um, and secondly, enrichment, which is very much around being able to, for example, if I took Chris, I've got Chris's name, um, I've got the, um, the last um, two parts of his date of birth, but I want to enrich that last two parts of his date of birth with, for example, the date. And so I might, for example, go into an IVR and I'll start going through authentication and I'll keep changing the number and eventually I'll get to a stage where I get through and I now know that that date of birth is correct. Um, and in that reconnaissance um, stage, what we're seeing is a, a tremendous increase in the, um, the sophistication of technology to automate those reconnaissance techniques. So spoofing the location of um, a call, the origination of a call, mainly a VoIP call, coming in, hitting the IVR within that contact center space, um, and going through uh, a series of data-based enrichment or validation exercises. And then a lot of the time that data is actually then used um, in alternative channels and sometimes also with alternative organizations within the ecosystem to be able to extract funds from accounts or to be able to purchase high-end goods. Um, and if I go into a little bit more detail about those types of attacks, what we're seeing is a lot of mule activity and a lot of debit card e-commerce activity occurring within the banking sector uh, where the, the mule accounts are being managed within the, um, the contact center because it's easier to manage a mule account in a contact center via a, than a digital channel. Um, and um, the, uh, the, the social engineering or the redirection of one-time passcodes that are delivered to phone numbers in order to then create digital relationships between things like a card and a wallet when you, for example, purchase things using things like Apple 
paper. If you move across into um, into things like the telco space, we're seeing a lot of um, fraud around the theft of handsets. And these are individuals that will offer a contract for a handset to an individual. Um, so again, if I pick on you, Trevor, you're, you're applying for a new iPhone. You go onto a broker website and you see a too good to be true offer. You fill out all of your information into a form of that broker and that broker actually places the order with the telco. And what happens is the telco ships a, a, a handset to the broker, who is ultimately a fraudster, um, and the broker never passes that handset on to the customer. And so at that stage, there is an issue where a high-end handset with a very high value is lost, um, and the loss sits with the telco, um, and the broker is actually the individual committing the fraud. And then when you, you move into things like the insurance sector, you have a very similar attack typed by the, 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 the contact center, where, for example, you are, you're seeing ghost brokers um, fulfilling applications for insurance policies with fictitious or different um, end customer information. So in this scenario, you know, Chris could be, for example, an 18 year old looking to insure a Ferrari. Um, and one person has a very good rate for insurance, but actually the broker takes the money from Chris and actually sends a different person's information, which is, could be an individual with 30 years and no claims, a very different profile to get that rate. And you wouldn't realize that you're, um, you have a problem with that insurance policy potentially for years until there's an actual accident. And actually when a claim comes through, you, you now have a mismatch of information. And so there are very different problems, but, but ultimately the, the underlying problem for all three of those sectors is the fact that um, the services that are provided to callers um, are the same services that are provided by digital channels, but the ability to forensically interrogate the network, where that call came from and its intent, is somewhat um, inferior to the digital channels and the, the technological advancements we have there around things like device fingerprinting, bot management, behavioral biometrics as an example. And so it becomes much more difficult to be able to um, to tackle those those threats um, without really impacting the large percentage of callers who are legitimate customers. Um, and so really, that, that that to give you kind of a summary view, uh, very different MOs, but ultimately the same um, exploitation across different sectors. Do you know, one of the things that really leaps out at me, Tim, is a word that you've used several times during during that um, explanation there you use the word call or callers because i think a lot of people when they think about um fraud threat you know, cyber threats they think exactly that cyber something sort of lurking in the digital environment but it seems to be what you're saying is that there is a lot of this going on in the traditional old school telephony voice channel that's, that's absolutely right. And and if you think about, you know, taking a slight tangent and you, you look at, for example, the, um, the there's a huge amount of public um, information now within the within the press around victims of scams. Um, and when you look at the way that criminals are targeting the individuals who fall prey to 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 scams, a lot of the um, the, the attack is 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 human to human. It's, it's, it's preying on that humane element that you can't necessarily do in a digital channel. And so we're seeing a large number of criminals moving away from digital based frauds back into the humane engagement to be able to extract large amounts of information. And so it's not just contact centers that are seeing this and about the loop of frauds is coming back round, but it's also customers that receive direct phone calls from the same gangs, and we've seen that within our, our consortium data, that the same gangs are directly contacting the end customer and also directly contacting the businesses that provide the services to those customers and really triangulating them. And that, that really is, when you see a seismic shift in the market, it does tell you that the posture that organizations have to provide those services from telephony are, are inferior when it comes to that channel versus the digital channels. And, you know, that, that's a, that's, I think, you know, that's a, that's a common thing. You know, we, we saw a lot of regulatory change over the last five or six years around payment services directive two, and the, the ability to, to apply what we call strong customer authentication in the digital channels. Um, and so, you know, a lot of organizations were able to invest heavily in, in their technology and internet and mobile banking, for example, and app based um, 
engagements with customers. And, and so we saw a lot of money move in, in, the, in, the, in the traditional investment cycle to that space. And, and as a result, as, as the controls became stronger there, naturally the fraudster is going to move to, uh, to, 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 to the weaker space. And, and, and I think that swing is, is now starting to really become a problem for people. See, so what can contact centers do? Um, how can you detect fraud? What can we do to prevent what you're describing? Yeah, good question. I think there's there's uh, there's an industry term. It's a bit cheesy, but it, it, it stands true, which is there's no silver bullet. Um, some of the best organizations introduce layers of defense um, and create uh, more agility within the way in which they, they ultimately maneuver callers through their ecosystem. And I think when you think about the telephony um, channel, particularly the contact center channel, if we honed in on the contact center channel for now, you've, you've normally got a traditional route in. You, you have a, you know, essentially a network call that comes in from the network layer into um, an IVR. Um, and that IVR is where the caller creates some level of relationship between themselves and a customer account. They become identified. Um, in the IVR, they will have access to um, a number of services, typically the lower level services that represent a, a, a lesser risk. Um, and then through the IVR, a routing into an agent, a human being. Um, and then ultimately past the human being, there are then systems in the background that manage the financial and non-financial adjustments that need to happen for, uh, for customers and for fraudsters who have made those requests you know, through that human being. And what that typically does is it presents four points, and you'll hear me talk a lot about the four points of interaction, where there is an opportunity to change the treatment. Um, and that really is around IVR routing. And this is about being able to detect and identify that the caller's intent is illegitimate before you start to provide information to that caller. That could be balance inquiries, it could be allowing them to get through multiple attempts of IDMV with that date of birth. So being able to be intelligent with the way in which you service customers within the IVR. Um, the second piece is really around the routing. And when you route a call, for example, into a different group of handlers of those calls that might have a different skill set about empowering those agents to understand the context and the recommendations for treatment. And, and, you know, some organizations are a lot more advanced. They've, they've, they've done very well aggregating information through widgets and visualization tools. So there's a single pane of information when a caller lands in, in the contact center. And other organizations are still kind of grappling with the challenge that agents have to hop and alt tab through five, six, seven different systems to, to really serve the customer. And the organizations that have created that single pane view are in a much better position to be able to enrich the, the context around risk so that agents are appropriately geared with the information to handle the caller. Um, you then move into what I would consider to be a more systemic integration, which is really about taking insights of risk and enriching payment or fulfillment systems that, that ultimately manage that 360 view of the customer. That could be the CRM, could be a fraud tool, that sits in the back end that, that, that has a, a decision on whether or not money can be sent, whether or not a new card can be issued, whether a handset can be sent to that address, and really about adding telephony intelligence into that area. And the final area is forensics and around being able, about being able to identify networks of criminality in that data so that you find other matches that haven't necessarily called, but are a attack surface component that could call you and could exploit you uh, but have been seen elsewhere and that's really about helping law enforcement with regards to being able to shut down the gangs and actually take them off the streets and if i if i kind of go back up those four points to the beginning the there's a tremendous amount of network level intelligence that we can provide organizations that really removes the masks that criminals are very good at putting on that allow them to disguise themselves when the IVR sees them. And if you, you really can't um, combat these, these issues unless you are enabling the, the flow of that network, network intelligence into something that allows you to make actionable decisions. If you can't make actionable decisions, then you can't reroute, you can't 
prevent a user from going through you know up to 31 different date combinations to validate a piece of information you can't provide meaningful insight to a caller um, that it has to handle that risk and i was talking to somebody yesterday in, 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 who, who's consulting with a very large us firm and um they have 99.8% uh, of callers in their organization are legitimate. And one of the challenges they said is that, you know, that their, their handlers may only see one fraudster every month. And how do you keep someone on their toes and fresh when they only handle one of those cases every month? And you could say, well, you need to reroute it. Well, that's great. How do I do that? Because the IVRs are often built to be binary. Um, and then secondly, well, if I can't reroute it, how do I make sure that I provide meaningful insight to customers? And, and that's where we've seen a lot of value within the way we've designed our proposition, which is very much about we collect network information around callers. And we make sure that at each stage of those four points, we're able to answer a different set of questions for the organization, because not every organization will integrate at those four points. They have different appetites for experience and for control. But you'll see a combination of those different integration points will be used um, to solve for the problem in the context of the consumer experience they want to maintain. Okay, so so on that basis, what sort of red flags or warning signs uh, that could potentially indicate potential fraud into a contact centre at a very very early stage? Um, so so we found that. Um, over 40% of the value that we provide our customers is through um, what we call the Smart Numbers Protect Consortium. And the cons at a very high level, the consortium allows um, organizations to associate caller data with known fraud gangs. Um, and if I give you an example, we are currently in, a, in, a, in, in, in an investigation of a large-scale fraud attack where um, we've seen the same caller data come into both the telco and the financial institution. But what they're looking to do with those two organizations is distinctly different. Now, the, the, in the banking space, we're seeing the, the, the criminals loading cards onto digital wallets on, an, on handsets and on phone numbers that have not yet been seen in the ecosystem. And in the telco space, we're seeing the criminals ordering the handsets and provisioning the numbers. Wow. Now, the first case of fraud was when we suffered a card fraud loss in the banking space, but by, by associating that card loss with the caller data, we were able to tell the telco that those calls are coming into your contact center. And so that, that direct matching and being able to share the context cross member meant that they are able to um, delay the shipping of handsets to the next day which gives them a window of time to investigate the callers, confirm that they are in fact illegitimate, and then prevent the handsets from going out. And in that scenario, um, the, the two integration points were the, the fraud system and the forensics. But they're now talking about giving the, the handler and empowering the agent to be able to challenge the caller on the legitimacy of their request because they want to now move from detecting the fraud to preventing it. And so in that scenario, we're, we're now working on how do we create a widget they can place into their desktop to be able to signpost a very specific type of fraud and to tell them that this caller is coming in. Now, what mask is that fraudster wearing? The fraudster is doing two things. One, withholding their number, um, which means that the presentation layer data, which we call the CLI or the call the line identifier, is not able to be captured by the telco. Um, and that means that they have to trust the individual in good faith that who they say they are is who they, who they are. Um, and then when they're not pres uh, withholding their number, they are spoofing the origination number. Um, and the calls are coming from abroad from very structured VoIP originating groups. Um, and we use audio data to be able to detect that there is a VoIP call coming in via a spoof and that the number that's coming in is not trusted. And so that network level in in information, but the fact that we've taken that data and given a level of confidence that this is the specific technique that the criminal is using allows the organization to understand how to treat the caller differently. But also when combined with the consortium data, 
means they don't need to wait for the fraud to happen to be told there's a problem. Um, and that just to give you an example um, of kind of the cross sector challenge, um, you know, the combination of matching and sharing of information in real time and being able to, to take the spoofing or withheld caller mask off in real time really allows you to, to start to challenge the caller at the earliest point possible. Do you know what, do you know what really sort of occurs to me here, Tim? It's that we seem to be operating still in sort of almost the, the dark ages when it comes to identifying people. If you think about what we ask, I mean, typically a contact, you phone up a contact centre, they'll ask for the first line of your address, your date of birth, really basic information, which is often publicly available. And I'm just sort of thinking particularly about an organisation that I spoke to recently and that I was actually phoning to say, some documents which you were supposed to send me haven't arrived that's great can i identify who you are and they asked me my name my address the type of um engagement i had i'm not going to mention the, the company or, or what it was about and um my date of birth all that information was in the letter that's gone missing so it's for me what really leaps out here is that perhaps the way that a lot of businesses are um identifying and because we all get very you know it's, it's such a big thing isn't it id and v we've got to know who we're talking to and everyone gets very sort of quite aggressive i think in some cases you know in getting that id and v done which takes up a lot of time as a proportion of the call yet what we're actually doing i think particularly from what you're saying is that we're not being very robust in, in that at all correct you're right. And, and I think the challenge there is there are there are more. So, you, you know, when you look at the technology that's available, right, um, you know, there, there are voice biometric solutions that, that allow you to start to uh, move down what we would call more of an inherent based authentication, something you are. Um, but there's a, a, a major focus in things like that technology on one, how do you enroll a voice? You know, how do you create the relationship between that audio biometric and, and a user, which typically requires other authentication. But also, a lot of organizations don't have the frequency of interaction with customers to, to warrant enrolling and managing a profile. You know, if you're an insurance provider, as an example, you typically will have one or two touch points with a customer over a number of years. One would be, for example, taking out a policy. Two would be amending a policy. And three would be making a claim. And so, you know, there, there aren't sufficient enough touch points for um, active biometric solutions to really work well. What we have seen are, uh, and this is where I think some of the digital capabilities are, are quite interesting. The, you know, we've seen organizations um, start to introduce things like click to call, where, for example, they originate a call within a, a, a mobile app and that app has got the right security posture in there. So when a call comes in, there's a there's a handshake with with a, you know a, a code that's shared between two two devices behind the scenes to be able to say this call is coming in via because it's it's been given a code that's invisible to the user and I've verified that's the code that's come into my my organisation. That's an example where leveraging some of the digital um, capabilities and enhancements could improve the posture of um, a contact centre and and ultimately improve trust of the caller. And that takes the entire IDMV scenario out. Um, there are other scenarios where, for example, if you think about some of the things I was talking about earlier, if you have a phone number that's coming in, a call that's coming from a phone number, you've had that phone number on file for that customer for a significant period of time, and you know that the call is originating from that number, there's a far greater level of trust in that caller because you know that it's coming from something that you've had for that customer for a very long period of time. And what's the probability of a customer losing their handset or having their handset stolen, physical theft in that point in time, unlocking that machine and then making a phone call to an organization. So that, you know, being able to detect that the originating number is different to the presentation number is actually a very key indicator for fraud that I think you know any organization in the example you just gave would benefit from without having to go through heavy, cumbersome, inherent-based authentication techniques. But what it does mean is that you need to have 
a more dynamic way of, of presenting context to a handler so they understand what has already been accomplished when a caller lands with them and what else needs to be done. Because if you don't do that, what happens is you fall back into binary IDMV processes, fixed process. And all that means is you create repetition to what you've been through before as a caller. Um, and you end up falling back to what we would call knowledge-based authentication questions, which as soon as it's compromised, that knowledge is useless. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are a few scenarios there, you know, biometrics, um, click to call and app based originating call techniques and also trust signals that you can get from that network layer to be able to improve uh, the confidence that the, the caller is in fact legitimate. Uh, they, the technology is there, right? I just think that it can't be naturally implemented the same way across different sectors because of the frequency of interaction and the nature of the interaction of the genuine caller population. You have to think about the fact that whilst fraud is a problem, a poor consumer experience or not being able to service a customer is a much bigger problem. Um, and the callers that come into a contact center are often individuals that are the most vulnerable. And we have yeah. a duty of care to protect them. Fascinating. So give us some numbers or give us some sort of idea. Of what's the impact that fraud in the contact center environment is having um, how's it how's it affecting customers and and contact centres? So, very very good question. Um, and again, this is actually a very difficult one to manage because if I come back to the first point around the three key stages within a broad attack lifecycle that contact centres enable, um, the the first two don't actually have a material loss assigned to them, which is the reconnaissance and what we call the preparation, which is where you're manipulating information on an account to maximize your chances of, a, of, of an extraction of funds. And that could be adding an additional user to the account, a beneficiary, a power of attorney. It could be suppressing notifications so that the, customer, the genuine customer doesn't get a, a pop-up on their phone or a statement to their door that says the money's gone. Um, and, and, and also things like altering things like contact information. So that's what we call kind of the preparation for a, a, a cash-out event. The cash out events often sit within um, things like card fraud losses or new account opening losses or first party fraud losses. So they're categorized very differently. So it, it, it can sometimes be quite difficult to quantify the amount of money lost through the contact center. Um, and so what you find is that there are different levels of maturity within fraud teams within organizations. And, this is really down to the power of analytics more than anything and about being able to create relationships and data from different sources. So if we take a, a real life example, from our consortium customers, we know that 61% of confirmed frauds for scams, cards, um, and NAO, new account opening, have had a touch point in the contact center from the fraudster. Wow. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the fact that they came in, we were able to prevent the loss in the contact center, of course, because there are false positives, there's different constraints you need to manage within the contact center. But what that does tell us is that when you look at the UK finance statistics, for example, and their fraud report, and the fact that, you know, scams alone is 67 million pounds in, in 2022 into 2023, a subset of that is via telephony channels. And so this is a multi-million pound problem for just the financial sector, let alone some of the other um, industries that don't necessarily have to report the same, to the same standard that the financial institutions have to. And the cost to control that fraud is, is, is bared in other areas, right? P&L losses, so net and gross losses, um, operational costs to, to handle claims, um, false positives where, for example, transactions are declined and the business moves elsewhere. And also um, um, full-time equivalent or FT costs, handler costs within the contact center. We talked about the fact that, you know, um, the IDMV process is a multi-minute process within a call, right? Why does IDMV get done in the contact center? It's because the request that an individual wanted to automatically serve in an IVR required a higher level of approval than what the company was prepared to allow an IBR to have. You know, I'll let you do a balance inquiry automatically because that's a low risk event, but I won't let you move money to a new beneficiary. You need to speak to a customer, an agent for that. 
But I and suppose so, by having the balance inquiry, so now you know how much money is in the account, that gives you, you a can answer the question. question. Right, right. Exactly, exactly. And so that's the trade-off. So this is this is a, a double-figure million-pound problem, but it surfaces in every payment instrument that we give the end consumer, whether it be handsets, whether it be insurance products, whether it be a card, whether it be a mobile banking app, that's where you see it. But the more sophisticated organizations use analytics to create the relationships in the data that come from the network level, come from the consortium, and then move into the cash out space. And that's, that it is a very difficult challenge to solve without having strong analytics um, and, and good partners in the technology space. Oh. Now, I know that uh, one of the real uh, things I'm looking to hear, and I think our viewers will want to hear about, is some real life examples of fraud that uh, have occurred in contact centers that you know of that you could share with us, obviously without mentioning any specific company names, but just some examples yep. of what the criminals have been up to, how they've been trying to do it, and and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, we we absolutely have to be a little bit careful um, because it's not just uh, your customers that watch these videos. Um, and so, you know, we, we, but, but what we found recently, um, a South African gang um, have been targeting UK telcos. Um, the MO or the modus operandi of the criminals has been um, very much similar across all those organizations. Um, a spoofed inbound call um, that makes them look like the, 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 the customer. Um, a, a vulnerability story that they give to the agent to achieve a level of compassion. Um, a need to add a new user to the account. You know, typically the, the, the victim account is a vulnerable person. Um, and it's their niece or their nephew that's calling, um, and they need to make sure that they, they you know, they're looked after. Um, an issuance of credentials to that new person because they successfully get added, and then the successful extraction of all of their savings and funds. And through our consortium, we were able to identify the same gang targeting different banks. So the minute Bank One flagged it all the other banks were able to then say, "Yep, yeah, we're seeing that," and that that information is packaged and is. We're working with law enforcement on that at the moment. And, and, and that's an example of, um, you know, essentially targeting high net worth customers through things like IBR reconnaissance to validate balances, because then you know how much money you're going after. Identifying dormancy, so making sure these accounts don't have trading on. You can do that through statement history, for example. Um, and then adding additional users that have a, a justified relationship at face value through um, a story that is told of compassion to um, contact center agents. Um, and then ultimately digital cash out. So the losses born in the digital space. So that's an example um, of, of a scenario that we're seeing. We're also seeing many, many others, you know, individuals phoning up and, um, you know, claiming that the, uh, the debit card transactions on multiple mule accounts were in fact fraudulent. Uh, banks are obliged to refund the fraud um, or, or put the money back first, investigate second. So the money goes back, the money's spent, the investigation yields that the money shouldn't have been put back, but by then the money's already gone. Um, and the, 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 the um, bank accounts that these relate to are accounts that are opened by legitimate people but given to fraud rings. And those fraud rings are the people that then call and manage the accounts. Um, and so again, we we're able to identify that the uh, even if the callers mask their identity, they're the same individuals coming through on multiple accounts, and therefore you can start to see the ring of the accounts that they are actually in control of. So the only way you can really do that is by joining up network level intelligence um, and also account based information that the the financial institutions have. So a huge amount of collaboration, but really where you place the output of that collaboration is in the contact center. Because that's where the facilitation occurs. So I, I talked to a lot of um, vendors about, you know, because obviously AI is the is the topic of the day at the moment, isn't it? And looking at how we can deploy automation and AI into the contact center to start identifying, as you talked about, vulnerable customers. And what you said there, again, I think we need to be very, very conscious of because if the if the criminals are sort of kind of using that heartstring 
vulnerability, you know, to say the right thing, which the AI thinks, ah, oh, this is a vulnerable customer. We'll start doing something different to allow, I'm going to use perhaps what you guys will turn as a technical term, a backdoor somehow into an area of, of, um, of the operation or the process, which allows the fraud to be facilitated. Because I don't think people think about that as much. You know, they're thinking, well, you know, we're going to right. use AI, we're going to start sort of to try and, you know, automate some of these things. But it just seems like what you're saying is that those automations could become a vulnerability as well. The, any any automation is a vulnerability, right? Not just in the context of financial services, but you know, you can you see in the press, you know, self driving cars, and you see all yeah. all levels of, of automation, right? Um, the number of people that have proven that that Chat GPT and other um, AI uh, generative AI solutions um, can be taught to behave badly, right? Um, the I think the key thing here is about um, the 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 fact that there are layered controls that you can implement and you have to understand the efficacy of the control in the content context in which you use it so if i take for example voice biometrics right you go back i think it was 10 years or so there was um a red hat convention um sorry a black hat convention in vegas um that it was possible to spoof a voice um, and pass one of the prominent voice biometric solutions controls as a genuine match to a person, right? And so we know that there are scenarios where um, you can spoof a call, you can spoof the voice, um, and what generative or conversational AI solutions do is they, they actually move a customer into a, a longer standing conversation, and so whilst whilst the risk could be automated and therefore the scale of the problem could grow, the duration of the touch points of conversation with an individual increases because you are moving to something more conversational. And what that does is it means that there are multiple points in that conversation that you can reassess risk. So what you'll find is that it's not that things don't work, it's that they have to be deployed in a more conversational manner to be able to understand deviations, subtle deviations. And, and an organization that does this very well in, um, in, the, um, in the digital spaces is, um, is kind of biocatch where they look at behavior across a session um, and they have multiple points in that session where they keep checking that things are the same and they're able to identify deviations. Because a customer and a fraudster will look the same until they get through a control and then they'll look very different because their yeah. intent is very different, right? And so you need to make sure that when you think about things like IDMV, IDMV is a point in time interaction, but risk assessment should be conversational. And so your system should be having multiple conversations as there are deviations in the way in which behavior is analyzed. And you're then triangulating around the anomalies. And so I think, you know, whilst there are huge technological enhancements, I don't think it necessarily is changing the profile of uh, risk. It's changing the way in which technologies that manage risk should be deployed and used. And the risk for me really is, I don't think we really know how well those technologies will perform in anger as the criminals ramp up their sophistication. And the only real loser out of that battle is the customer that can no longer be served because the risk appetite isn't there, right? And so I think a lot of work needs to be done in studying that and slowly introducing more conversation and automated capabilities to market in a way that is risk considerate first and customer servicing second rather than the other way around. Amazing. That is I, it just blows my mind when you think about that, just as a concept. Sorry, Trevor. Yeah, yeah. whole different, different aspects, isn't it? Yeah. Obviously, one of the big challenges that contact centres have is to provide seamless customer experience. Now, how can contact centres uh, balance the need for security and fraud, but still providing a seamless customer experience for when they are contacted by customers and importantly potential customers as well um so 
the one thing I would just say is that most failures in serving customers are der derived by a couple of things. Systems that don't touch the customer but touch the decision are not equipped with the right data or insight to provide an accurate answer. So that's where data gets lost between systems in an organization behind the scenes. You know, and, and an example of that is where a call comes into a contact center. And, you know, I, I think I said at the beginning, uh, an agent is still having to navigate five systems. You know, if an agent is navigating five systems, I can guarantee you those systems are not communicating with each other at the same time the agent is communicating with the customer. What that does is it creates failure demand because it means that there's a high chance that what the customer thinks they have achieved on the call is not what the systems have decided to do later, right? And that creates a second or a third call, right? That's the first one. The second one is really about agent empowerment and training, right? And being able to be more agile in the way in which you understand risk. Um, nine times out of 10, the reason that organizations fail their customers is because customers can't get through the controls because they've made the controls too difficult to get through. The number of times, kind of, you know, my, my, my grandma is an example. Um, she, she used to call me in tears because she was worried that someone had stolen her pension, not because someone had stolen her pension, but because she just genuinely worried. And when she called the bank, they asked the questions that she just did not know the answer to because she had a little notepad next to her phone with everything written down in it because she couldn't remember where she was supposed to be the next day, let alone the last time she went to a DIY shop, which was one of the questions someone asked her. Um, and so if you don't understand your customer and therefore you haven't controlled the way in which you then create a personalized experience for that user, you are going to generate failure demand. And that's predominantly driven by binary processes that control things like ID and B with no insight as to the, the, the legitimacy of the inbound caller or their intent. So being able to understand intent and to overlay trust should drive the level of control that an individual should have to go through. And that has to be done in real time, not after the event. So just a couple of examples there, I think, is, is really much being able to contextualize the caller, being empathetic to the caller's need and the controls that you introduce, and making sure that back-end systems are chatting better and more frequently than the conversations that are happening in the, in the front line. So just obviously when we, when we start thinking about fraud and and this kind of thing, when you think about regulation and we think about compliance, et cetera, is there anything specific, are there specific regulations or compliance requirements that people should be thinking about? Perhaps that in your in your experience, people aren't perhaps fully considering when it comes to this this area. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things. And again, I think it's sector specific. Um, we, all, we all get excited about, you know, GDPR, don't we? And uh, PCI, <laughs> those are the things everybody talks about. But, you know, what, what else is there, I suppose, is the question. So there, there's, there's, there's a couple of things here. So, so one of our product managers, Chris, um, came and spoke to me the other day internally and said um, there's a real area of passion for him. And, and his area of passion is that the regulations um, – uh, enforce a greater level of constraint on the the organization that the regulation applies to than the criminal. And it was quite a profound statement, right? Because it's not an obvious statement that people necessarily consider when they think about regulation or change. They don't go, okay, how does this impact me? But how does it impact the fraud stuff? And he, he's actually taken an action to go away and, and actually look at the delta based on the use cases that our customers kind of suffer between those constraints that specific regulations like GDPR apply to, um, to, to, uh, to organizations, whereas they don't apply to the criminal. Because that delta, I think, is, is the thing that you have to measure when it comes to talking about investment in technologies or tools or people to be able to, um, to continue to serve or to open up new markets or verticals within your organization. Um, but the bit that I think, you know, if I just said the financial sector, for example, um, the, pay, the PSR have been drip feeding in later this year a shared liability model between um, beneficiary banks and sender banks. So this is a sender bank is the bank that is sending the money and the beneficiary bank is the, 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 the bank that's receiving the money. 
And so when you think about liability, liability is a word that a lot of people talk about now in, um, in a number of financial and fraud contexts. Historically, the liability, if you take scams as an example, um, a customer sends an authorized payment, they're coerced into sending money, they're pushing it. So they call it an authorized push payment. And because they've sent the money somewhere and provided consent via a strong level of ID and B, the bank has held the customer liable for that loss. Now, a number of years ago, the, the um, which super complaint in the financial ombudsman um, looked at that and said, this isn't fair. And um, banks were asked to, to demonstrate the requisite level of care. They had to demonstrate they had sufficient controls in place to identify vulnerability and consent. And so a percentage, a large percentage of that loss from scams was moved to a liability perspective from the victim to the bank, right? In tens of millions of pounds. And the bank was the sender bank, the bank that owned the account in which the money was sent from. And then they had to try their best to ring the bank that received it by what they call an indemnity process to be able to get the money back. But for, you know, the criminals are very good. They've got the mule accounts as so they've moved the money on too quickly. So if the money's gone, the bank can't send it back. So sometimes you get some of it back. Sometimes you get all of it back. But most of the time you've got none of it back. And now the PSR said, hang on, there's a shared responsibility between the beneficiary and the sender bank. So now what has moved from the victim to the bank is now shared between two banks. And the banks now have to demonstrate that they have sufficient controls in place to manage mules and also the fraud that happens on the, the sender end. And that regulation is fascinating to me because if I go back to the fact that 61% of the time calls are being made, what happens if the calls that were being made into the contact center of the beneficiary bank were the people managing mule accounts? That's going to impact their liability and therefore a large amount of millions of pounds could potentially actually be moved in liability from the payer to the beneficiary. And they, a lot of organizations haven't provisioned for that. So how do you, how do you manage that issue? How do you start to really squeeze the, um, the impact that mule accounts via the contact center has? Um, that's just one example of a regulatory change. Um, the other one that I think I'm, I'm particularly interested in and I'm following kind of in, in anger are the, um, the digital bills around digital identity and identity sovereignty. Because mm -hmm. those bills and, and you know, uh, our, our government is, is also pushing a digital bill. You know, there are tremendous examples of this in places like Sweden with the Bank ID program where you have a digital identity that represents you. And you use that digital identity as a means to proving who you are. What I, I'm keenly following in those um, those circuits are how those capabilities are being exposed to all channels, not just digital. How we're being inclusive so that they can be leveraged. And and those are um, difficult conversations to have because um, the technologies that underpin a lot of those um, are digital only technologies. So how do you make that accessible to non-digital channels in a way that's safe? Because I do believe that there will be mandates that come in around the use of sovereign identity schemes within the UK and in broader European countries. And if we don't, um, if we don't make sure that telephony as a channel is considered and is covered, Mm -hmm. then we're not going to solve the fraud problem. We're going to bring more mm -hmm. into the contact centers. And then we're going to create, we're going to move that problem into the way we service vulnerable customers again. Because we're just going to have to put harder controls in place. Yeah. And that's that just, does, it's not acceptable for me. So those are a couple of examples of areas of regulation I, I find interesting. I think contact center professionals should be considering, which is, am I sat on, honey pots of data within my contact center that could mean that I'm more liable for mule liability. How do I control that and close it? And actually, how do I come in from the cold on digital and sovereign identity schemes as a channel to make sure that I can continue to serve the group of customers that prefer this route to, 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 to service? Mm, interesting. Okay, so going forward, what steps do you feel contact centers should take to educate and train their employees uh, on fraud, fraud protect, prevention? I think two things spring to mind. Make sure that you can intelligently root calls. 
because that will allow you to manage a smaller and more focused population of agents to train. It's an uneconomical model to train your entire contact center because there is not that there typically are not sufficient calls to justify the training and focus on augmenting data in a visually attractive way to your handlers. Um, so if you are able to adapt to those threats away from the handler and be focused on presenting information in a consumable and instructional manner when the call comes in. Keep it simple, right? Um, there are huge, there's a, a huge number of tools that uh, are capable of consuming widgets from different delivery networks, from different vendors that can aggregate for you. Um, keep it visual, keep it multi-sensory. Um, and make sure it's real time. Absolutely amazing. Trevor, I don't know about you, but I found this absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think obviously just the last question I think we've got here is uh, what emerging technologies and trends use, are being used out there to combat uh, fraud in contact centres? So it, it's interesting, actually. I don't think it's necessarily the emerging technologies per se. It's, it's it's expanding existing technologies to solve for different conversational techniques. Um, and so I think the it, you know the way I kind of talk about it internally is stretching the fabric to cover a greater number of corners. Right? You know, we we know that we can forensically interrogate interrogate network level data. We know that we can authenticate and um, authenticate people through voice. We know that we can communicate with digital channels. We know that we can visualize content to call us for authentication. What I think a lot of organizations have not done is orchestrate the use of those technologies in a way that gives them a final decision or outcome that they can trust. So I think the emerging technologies are not necessarily emerging technologies in the industry, but they're emerging technologies because they're becoming accessible to the contact center community which are terms like orchestration, right? Actually, how do I orchestrate the conversation between different risk or authentication signals? And then how do I use outputs to be able to manage um, call flow and manage user experience? Um, one thing that we are seeing a massive swing on is people moving away from legacy infrastructure to contact center as a service technologies. And I do see that as being an infrastructure cornerstone to, to, to achieve agility um, because there's a huge number of technologies that you can turn on in a turnkey manner using CCAS technologies that historically I've seen 12 to 18 month programs, mm. you know, just to get a capability into the on-premise infrastructure flow. And so I would say that there's a much more streamlined route to live for call routing and for contact center management. But if you look at the technologies then that are available to you, they are so much easier to consume now than they were five years ago. And that then means that you can invest in how can you use them to solve your problems. And I think that's where you know, Chris comes in and, and the, the, the huge amount of thought leadership that CGI have around helping organizations bring the technology to the table to solve real life problems. Um, but again, moving into those it's not necessarily new technologies to the industry, but new to the to the channels, orchestration, contact center as a service, network level intelligence. And those are the three areas I think that you, you absolutely, if you haven't got them on your roadmap and budgeted for this year, you need to go back and think about where you can get the money because those are, are huge enablers um, for so many things, not just for prevention, but for, for customer experience and also moving new servicing capabilities into the contact center. Um, so, so that that would be my advice. Great, thank you very much. Okay, well, I think that brings uh, to a close today's podcast. I think it's been brilliant. So much there that people there, should there know. There's just so much to unpack there, isn't yeah. there? And I think anyone who involved in any business that's I was going to say, you know, contact center, but it goes beyond there. But you know, if you've got a customer and uh, and and you've, you know, any kind of business, you need to be thinking about this kind of stuff because yeah. it's important that's all i can say really i think it's, it's just so important to um and i think our focus in our industry i mean me and you trevor we talk about a whole raft of different elements of the contact center world and as i said earlier 
AI is is just everyone's just going, we must get some AI and some chat GPT. And I can't remember the last time someone actually put front and center what Tim has been talking about. Yeah, I, I just and in so many cases these days of, of scams and fraud, it's on the telly, on the news, time in time. And of course, contact centers are there. There's so many of them, they're they're just a sitting target for yep. um criminals to go for. It's you exactly. know it's the, the crime, you know, it's the modern day bank robbery or exactly. robbery in the post office or, yeah. or whatever you want to do, where you went in with a, a shotgun and a, a swag bag, you know, this is the way they're doing things now. Okay, so I think this will be the first of a number of podcasts we're going to do around this subject. So I'd just like to thank Tim from uh, Smart Numbers for your time. The view, the insight, it's been brilliant. I've learned a lot myself today. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. And my co-host, Chris D'Souza, thank you so much for, for sharing with me, Chris. And I hope that everybody's enjoyed this. We will make the podcast available on our website. Uh, for you to download and to share with your colleagues, especially anyone in the in the cyber security team or crime team. But um, thank you so much. Thank you very much for your time and joining us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Trevor. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thanks for having me.